Well, you got to admit the boy's game. He won't last around that. This Jamaican voice is on his nails. Punch like the kick of a mule. <laughs> there, what I tell you. The referee stopped the fight. Well, it was there. Crazy crowd, the English. Always shout for the underdogs. But I bet it'll be different next week for the Empire title, Bart. If there is an Empire title. And what do you mean by that? Staff troubles. There's an LCC ruling at Earl Scotland. The old area must be cleaned up right after the meeting. I don't know how we manage tonight, but alone next week. You, uh, you short of staff, Mr. Moore? Who's desperate? Then I'm the answer to a maiden's prayer. Ring up Grosvenor 5995. That's the phone number of Assignments Unlimited at 33 Half Moon Street. Aubrey Mason at your service. At Assignments Unlimited, we do anything, anywhere, at any time. 33... Half moons. Karen is really a quiet sort of chap with a plebeian taste for football, boxing, and Wild West pictures. He's rugged, of course, which is just as well, because Karen has an unfortunate habit of attracting trouble. It's never intentional. He explains it by saying he has a mesmeric metabolism that attracts the seamy side of life. Certainly, Mr. Moore gave no indication of what was to come when I interviewed him on the Earl's Court job. Cleaners after the big fight next week, Mr. Moore. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure that we can supply the number of workers you'd need for that. Oh, it's not the actual sweepers, Mr. Mason. We can get them from the labor exchange. You see, they're mostly West Indians and work well enough if properly supervised. Mr. Cannon told me that you might be able to supply two or three men to act in a supervisory capacity with the work. Oh, yes, that we can do easily. I'll put two of my most reliable men on the job. Will uh, one of them be Mr. Cannon? Oh, without doubt. He'll be delighted at the opportunity of watching the big fight free of charge. May I send you a couple of complimentary tickets, Mr. Mason? For Friday night? Oh, it's kind of you, Mr. Moore, but, well, I must decline, unfortunately. Oh, not interested in professional boxing? Oh, it's not that, actually. It just so happens that this Friday night, my club's having its own championship match. I'm an active participant. You're a boxer? <laughs> no, Mr. Moore, not nearly so romantic. Ours is a chess championship. Check. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I think you'll find the men I send to be reliable, Mr. Moore. And I wish you a successful Friday evening. As you, Mr. Cannon, would say, this Empire title fight will be a knockout. Uh, hi. Any objections if I park in the booth here for the fight? Well, that depends. Are you an American? New York. You? Milwaukee. Well, regulation state only members of the staff are allowed in here. Well, then I guess it's okay. Cannon's the main boss of the cleaning team. Well, come right on in, Cannon. I'm Leslie Benn, National Broadcasting Corporation. Well, what do you know? You, uh, you making the fight commentary? That's right. The New York Board of Control recognizes this empire fight as a world eliminator, hence the broadcast to the states. Uh, now, if you sit quietly in the corner, nobody's going to say a word. But I said quietly and no bad words. Oh, well, my old mammy sent me to Sunday school every week. Stand by, Mr. Ben. You're hooked up in ten seconds from now. Uh, here we go. Give me full sound in number four, Booth. Good afternoon to all listeners on the NBC hookup. This is Leslie Benn reporting from the Earlscourt Stadium in London, England, where the time is 9.30 p.m. And the contenders for the British Empire Cruiserweight title are limbering up in their respective corners. Awaiting the gong for the first round, it'll set them in combat and decide who will have a tilt at the World Cruiserweight crown in Toledo in December. Both fighters are in good shape for the contest, and there's not a pound difference in weight between them. The champion, Ned Riley, with his scarlet shorts emblazoned with the green shamrock of Ireland, and the challenger, Sammy Bart, bedecked in a more somber black. The colors are symbolic. It'll be a red letter day for the winner and a black Friday for the loser. I expect a good fight since both boys have everything to gain by a win here in London, England. Some of you keen followers of the fight game will remember three years back when Nigel Bart, twin brother of Sammy, who's in the ring now, fought in the States. A larceny charge ended Nigel's career, but his twin brother has stepped right into his shoes to challenge the champion tonight. And there goes the bell for the first round. They meet in the center of the ring, both fighters summing each other up. Riley has a three-day crop of whiskers on his chin, a snarl on his face. Bart's cool, imperturbable, and large, rosy tin ear, the hallmark of his profession on an otherwise unmarked face. Riley leads with the left. Bart brushes to the side, sidesteps neatly. 
As he turns that great cauliflower ear, stands up like the plumed helm of Navarre. And suddenly the tempo's changed. Or comes storming in like a pressure light. A left, a left, another left, and a mighty chopping right that's got Riley reeling and the crowd's going berserk. Oh, this is a Sammy Bug we've never seen before. He comes in again and slams home that left and a right and another left and a right that chops down Riley like a meat axe. He's down, Riley's down. Left on him. Three, four. Well, he's up at four, but boy, his face looks like he's dive head first into a cement mixer. And Riley's down again, and he's down again. Oh, the crowd's going wild. He has a fear of something. He could cut your chump puzzles out of it. Four, five. The champion's game. He wants to get up, but the rest insisting on the compulsory count of eight after a second knockdown. And he's up, swaying on his feet as the challenger comes storming in, and it's a left and a left. And over comes that right to chop down the champ. He's down. Riley's down, and he'll put it back up this time. 60 seconds by my count, and I will keep the world champion of the British Empire. Taylor Temple, the world champion, is here to watch this fight tonight. And it's not going to be a buggy ride when he meets Sammy Bart in December. Sammy Bart, the new cruiserweight champion. Check. Your rook, Sir Thomas. I think you've got me, Mason. Check and mate. Thank you, Sir Thomas. I don't know how you do it, Mason. You're a fighter, all right. Oh, it's the bulldog spirit, sir. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Is the game concluded? Yes, Crawley. Another chess championship out of the way until next year. Uh, may I inquire who won, Sir Thomas? You may indeed, Crawley. Mr. Mason, undefeatable. The most rugged fighter in the kingdom. Oh, well, well. <laughs> <laughs> then you'll be able to answer the telephone, Mr. Mason. Telephone? What at this hour? Who is it? Uh, American intonation in the voice, Mr. Mason. Oh, I know who it is, Crawley. Uh, shall I plug in the extension, Mr. Mason? Uh, if you will. Well, I think this calls for a celebration. A bottle of port. Any dissenters? Oh, well, 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 ah, capital. Well, let's leave Mason to his telephone conversation and appoint Crawley Potman. Thank you. Hello? Oh, is that you, Cannon? Hello to you all. This is hot news straight from the Cannon's mouth. Cannon, are you drunk? No, I'm quite sober, Chief. I have watched a big fight from a broadcasting booth and seen the great Leslie Benn in action. Oh, good show. Uh, did he win? I mean, this Leslie Benn? No, no, no. Leslie Benn was the commentator. The protagonists were Ned Riley and Sammy Bart. Bart won and our job's completed. Already? But I thought you wouldn't be through until one in the morning. Well, the fight lasted one minute. Sixty seconds. What a challenge and what a champion. Cannon, look, if ever we get a job calling for a boxing commentator, our seat's passed on to you. But right now we have a little celebration going on in the club, so if you don't... Say, that's right, I forgot. You were playing in the chess championship tonight. How did it go, Chief? Extremely well, thank you, Cannon. No, what I mean is, who won? Well, I did, actually. Now, I must say... No, 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 hang hang on, Chief. Look, uh, I gotta see you tonight. Trouble? Maybe. Well, what is it? Well, one of the uh, Jamaican cleaners found a small parcel wrapped in brown paper under the ring in Sammy Bart's corner. It's addressed to Bart. Well, then why don't you give it to him? Well, there's a stain in one corner where something has seeped through. Yes? You guessed it, Chief. It's blood. All right, Cannon, dump it on the table. You say you found it under the ring by this uh, Sammy Bart's corner. Well, strictly speaking, Chief, one of the Jamaican cleaners found it. And he handed it to you? That's right. Are they reliable, these Jamaicans? Well, if you mean honest, yes. As anybody's honest who works as janitor. They're superstitious, too. This guy, Bart, wasn't expected to win. And yet he sailed through the champion like a maniac with a pole axe. So I told the Jamaican that it was probably voodoo. Well, what on earth did you do that for? Mr. Moore promised me a personal bonus if I got the place clean before midnight. When they heard about the voodoo, they had that joint as clean as a widow's parlor in half an hour flat. <laughs> Cannon, you're incorrigible. And not only that, I've got bad habits. Well, uh, what do we do, Chief? Open or deliver? Well, it might simply be meat. Mm, a pound of steak in case you got a black eye? I wonder what, it, what he was doing under the ring like that. Well, if I could offer my professional advice as a garbage expert, that entire arena was knee-deep in empty popcorn packets, torn-up tickets, newspapers for the fish and chips. And the whole place, only one small square, was free of garbage, under the ring. So, when the scaffold company took the ring away, it was impossible to miss seeing the package. Oh, that rather looks as though it was put there purposely. Well, you've got to be very short-sighted to mistake a boxing ring for a mailbox. Oh. Well, it's carefully wrapped and neatly typed. You know, it's our duty to hand this treasure over to Mr. Moore. 
Well, supposing uh, I opened it very carefully, you know, so as I could wrap it up again uh, very carefully. Well, that might be dangerous. No, it can't be a time bomb. Gunpowder is black. Oh, all right. But if he turns out to be a pound of liver, I'll have your blood. Okay, here we are. Wow. Maybe it was voodoo after all. Cannon. That's an ear. A human ear. That's it. His hand gently stroking his own generous lobe. And then it occurred to me that this was a very large ear, severed sharply but crudely from its owner's head. What could it mean? I glanced inquiringly at Cannon. Well, that's new. Maybe a day old. Yes, I was thinking the same thing. Well, who can he belong to? Well, search me. Maybe we got a modern Van Gogh running loose in London. Van Gogh was an artist. Anyway, he cut off his ear to send to his lady love. Well, it could be in reverse. A lot of these dames go dizzy over prize fighters. A girl's ear? Look at the size of it. Well, somebody's ears were burning last night for sure. Another facetious remark like that from you and I'll put a flea in your ear. Okay, Chief, okay. Now, look, my mind's made up. In the morning, I'm going to ring Mr. Moore and tell him exactly what's happened. Then it's up to him to take any action he thinks necessary. Okay, that's the end of the cleaning contract. What do you mean? Well, Mr. Moore is so pleased with the job we did tonight, he's coming round here in the morning to offer us a regular contract at his big flat promotionist. So? And one of the rules is that all lost property is deposited with the man in the box office. That's why he wants supervisors. Once he knows that we remove this parcel from the arena and open it, uh, you get what I mean, Chief? I don't like it, Cannon. The police should be informed. Well, there's, uh, there's no law against cutting off your ear. I mean, uh, legally, it's like cutting toenails. So, some nut cuts off his ear and sent it to the challenger, Sammy Bart. It's a man's ear and a big one at that. How do we uh, know why he did it? No, oh, all right, but... Well, what do we do with it? I say we're morally obliged to take it round to the police station, even if we do lose the cleaner's contract. No sense in cutting off your nose to spite your face. Cannon. Sorry, Chief. Now, look. Let me wrap it up again and take it round to Sammy Bart first thing. Oh, all right, you win. But I don't like it. I don't like it at all, Cannon. What on earth will Mr. Bart say when he opens it? Sammy Bart is the Empire champion and he comes from London, so you'll probably say... Yes? What's this here? The heavy leather-bound volume of Homer's Iliad that I hurled at Cannon crashed into a closed door. In a way, I was glad that he brought the grizzly parcel back to the office. I know very little about prize fighters, but I reasoned that Mr. Bart, having won his contest, would be feeling a little like myself. I must confess to a certain exhilaration at being the club chess champion, and the fighter must have felt the same. That parcel, if delivered on the night of his victory, would most certainly have ruined his great moment. But in one thing, Cannon was wrong. Sammy Bart might be a prize fighter from London, but his speech was impeccable. You come in, Mr. Cannon. I must apologize for the untidiness of my hotel suite. I slept late this morning. Understandably, champ. I watched the fight last night. You were great. Thank you. Oh, I'm a fan, you know. Never missed the big ones. Sat right up there with Leslie Benn, the commentator. The American? Yeah. They broadcast the fight to the States there. Uh, didn't you know? Oh, yes, of course. Well, he's tops in the States, you know. You, uh, you ever been to America? No. No, I've never been to America. They said at the desk that you had a parcel to deliver to me personally. Oh, yes, right. Uh, yeah. I've got it here. Well, who gave it, you may ask? Nobody. You see, I was in charge of the cleaners at the stadium, and one of the workers found this under the ring by your corner. It's addressed to you, so I thought I'd bring it round personally. Well, that was very kind of you. If you wait a minute, I'll see that you're suitably rewarded. Oh, no, that's okay. It's just part of my job. Uh, well, I've got to get back, so if you'll excuse I me... I wouldn't hear of it. Sit down, Mr. Cannon. Well, you see, I... Sit down. Okay. Sammy. Uh, nothing wrong, I hope, Mr. Boyd. Where up? Yes, Governor. Lock the door. Uh, yes, Governor. Uh, look, I've got a... Sit down, Mr. Cannon. How did you get this parcel? Well, it's, uh, it's like I told you. For the last time, where did you get this parcel? Hey, now, look, if you're trying to get turned... Yes, Mr. Cannon. Yeah, I should get tangled up with the future world champion. Okay, I'll come clean. Better. A drink? Yeah, scotch on the rocks. Weather? Yes, Scott. All right, Mr. Cannon. You were about to come clean. Well, you see, I uh, I work for an organization called Assignments Unlimited. Uh, you can check the numbers in the directory, Grosvenor 5995. 
I found the parcel just like I said, but I noticed there was blood that had seeped out. It's got you on the rocks. Hmm? Oh, oh, thanks. Thank so I uh, took it back to the office and opened it up to have a look. Well, the boss and me, well, we decided the best thing to do was to deliver it here this morning. What else could you have done with it? Well, the chief wanted me to deliver it to the police. Uh, have you any idea where this might have come from? Well, I figured it was some kind of nuts. Hey, all right, Weber. Now, Mr. Cannon, having delivered your strange parcel, what do you expect me to do with it? Mm -hmm. Take it to the cops, I guess. Yes, that would be the logical thing. Or throw it away. Forget the whole incident. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. No sense in keeping it. Forget all about it. That'd be hard for you, Mr. Cannon. I imagine your experience would make a good talking point in the pub. That I found an ear in a box and delivered it to the future world champion? You want to have me thrown out of every bar in town? It is an unlikely story, isn't it? <laughs> Crazy. Hmm. Very well, Mr. Cannon. You've proved to me that you're not some idiotic practical joker, so you may go. Weber? Well, uh, thanks, Mr. Bart. It's uh, nice to have met you. Oh, and uh, here's a fiver for your trouble. Well, oh. that's uh, very generous. I make a good friend, Mr. Cannon. Good morning. Cannon arrived back at the office at 10.30 and outlined his experience with the champion. I was surprised that so able a pugilist should be a man of such culture and wondered if the glorious days of gentleman Jim Corbett were to be resuscitated. Cannon, idly twisting the morning newspaper in his hands, had no such lofty thoughts. He, uh, he didn't talk like a prize fighter. Apart from that cauliflower ear, he doesn't even look like a prize fighter. Are you sure it was the Empire champion you saw this morning? Oh, no doubt about that, Chief. I watched that fight from the commentator's booth through the uh, telescope window. And that's better than ringside. I'd know Sammy Bart anywhere. Well, then I vote we forget the whole incident. Now, that's what Sammy Bart wants us to do. I gave him the ear and he gave me a fiver. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, I got the impression that he was trying to buy me off. I don't like that. If I'm right, Sammy Bart is pushing me around. And I don't let anybody push me around, not even the cruiserweight champion. And what's more, if he was slipping me a fiver to keep my mouth shut, then he must know where that ear came from. Check. And mate. So that makes a skeleton in Sammy Bart's cupboard. A one-eared skeleton that's rattling a money box under his nose. And the champ is headed for the big time. Take a look at the morning newspaper. Read the headlines. Sammy Bart to be crowned king in December. King? Now, that's what they call the world champion, the king. How quaint. And he'll receive a lot of money for this. Well, with closed-circuit television rights, about $3 million. Phew. Well, I think I'll get a trainer in for you, Cannon. Yes? A uh, Mr. Who? Ben? Uh, I asked him over, Chief. Oh, all right. Send him in, will you? Isn't that the commentator fellow you were telling me about? That's the boy. I heard him make a few remarks about the champ and the challenger last night. I just wanted to hear more. Oh, do come in, Mr. Ben. Thank you. Oh, hello there, Kenna. Enjoyed the fight last night? Great. Uh, Mr. Ben, this is uh, Mr. Mason, my chief. How do you do? I'll never better. Well, I got your message. What can I do for you? Well, we got a, a small problem, Mr. Ben. It's about Sammy Bart, the new champ. Uh-huh. Tell me, where did he get that... Uh, that great cauliflower ear. <laughs> Lucky you. I looked it up in the ring manual. I thought I might slip it into the broadcast as a tidbit if the fight got dull. Not that I had much chance. He got it in a fight in Millwall. Uh, not in the ring, either. A bunch of hoodlums worked him over with an iron bar. Uh, why do you ask? Uh, you said he had a, a twin brother. Uh, that's right. Nigel Bart. Great fighter, too. Maybe even better than Sammy. Well, what happened? Sir Nigel Bart. Mm -hmm. Oh, he was campaigning in the States. He, he got hauled in on a larceny charge and was convicted. Now, if that happens to a fighter, he loses his license, so that was the end of Nigel Bart. Mm. Tell me, uh, has, uh, has Sammy ever been to the States? To fight? Uh, no. No, but I heard tell he was in America around the time his brother Nigel was sent up the river. Mm -hmm. uh, and this Nigel, has he got a cauliflower ear? Mm -mm, not a mark on him. That's unusual for a prize fighter. Hey, look, uh, What's, what's all this about? Look, I want to have a talk with Sammy Bart, and I want you to come with me. Are oh, you kidding? Haven't you seen the special edition? No. Sammy Bart committed suicide this morning. Jumped from the roof of a block of flats. 
And so it seemed that we should never know the solution to the mystery of the ear. There it was in the newspaper. Sammy Bart, suicide. Complete and final. And then the telephone rang. Assignments unlimited. Is that Mr. Mason? Speaking. Is there a Mr. Cannon with you? Yes, he's one of my operators. He's with me at the moment, as a matter of fact. Would you like to speak to him? Not now. I'd like to talk to you both in, say, half an hour. But I must stress that our conversation be in the privacy of your office and completely confidential. Well, of course. May I ask who's calling? Your Mr. Cannon will know me. We had a little chat earlier this morning. My name is Bart. I didn't tell Cannon immediately. First, I thanked Leslie Benn, the commentator, and promised to take a more active interest in fisticuffs. Only when he'd gone did I tell Cannon about the phantom caller. Except that he wasn't a phantom. He arrived on schedule, a magnificent specimen of manhood, vibrant and very much alive. He addressed one remark to Cannon, who answered with a grunt, and then we let him have his head. I apologize for my rather high-handed treatment of you this morning, Mr. Cannon. You'll notice that I no longer have a cauliflower ear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I came to you because my brother's death this morning closes a tragic chapter in our family life. I had to speak to you because Sammy died during the time you were in my hotel suite. Once you read about his death, you'd feel obliged to go to the police. I'm Nigel Bart, of course, Sammy's twin brother. It was I who fought and beat Ned Riley last night, not Sammy. We were identical twins. No one could tell us apart, except for the cauliflower ear and Sammy's mental instability. The ear you saw on me last night was fabricated from rubber and glued over my own. There was one reason why I had to finish the fight quickly. A blow from Ned might have dislodged it. And my brother Sammy went downhill when our father died. Kept bad company, seldom out of trouble. I did all I could, but it was one battle I didn't win. I'd gladly have lost all the others, but it wasn't to be. I took him to the United States with me, hoping that a new environment might change him. But he was caught by the police, charged with larceny. And that was before his brush with the Millwall gang that damaged his ear. Well, in short, I rang the changes, stood trial for him. You probably know the result. Sammy tried hard to go straight. He turned professional. He was all right for a time. It didn't last. The rubber ear was made a while ago as a joke. And last night, when Sammy was in no condition to go into the ring, I planned with him to swap places again. The fact he was missing his last big chance to make good threw him right off balance cutting off his ear and sending it to me it was his last act of defiance before committing suicide. Well, there you are. The story we called The King and the Cauliflower Ear. <laughs>